seconds. Well, it is Wednesday morning. It's Let's Chat. And I am we're just waiting. There we go. I think we connected. And I am racing the clock this morning because I'm very aware of the fact that um, I'm just taking my shoes off. I'm very aware of the fact that load shedding is happening soon. So I'm really trusting that I will be able to share this message with you and give you the fullness of this message before the lights go out. Let's just pray this morning. Jesus, I want to thank you for your beauty, your glory, your grace, your love, your kindness. I want to thank you that you have prepared us for a time such as this. I want to thank you that we walk in victory, we walk in glory, we walk in light. We are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world. And I want to thank you that you have prepared your people for a time such as this. Friends, I was asked a question. Oh, Holy Spirit, just keep brooding in this place. Just keep brooding. Just keep brooding. I thank you for the seven spirits before the throne. I thank you so much that you will just give us an incredible revelation of what you are doing and of what the time and the season is that we are to live. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Sorry. Friends, I was asked to a question the other day. So what does the end time prophetic people look like that God is raising up in this time? And I want to say that that question is answered very simply in the word of God. Because God said that before Jesus came, before the coming of the Christ, before the coming of the Messiah, that there would be the spirit of Elijah. Elijah would come before the coming of the Christ. And so we've got to know, sorry, I'm just, I haven't had time to put my notes into, into a, a file this morning because God's literally been speaking to me as I've been getting ready to come and minister to you. But anyway, God said that the spirit of the that Elijah would come before the coming of the Christ. And we know that John the Baptist was the Elijah that came before Jesus came. He was the Elijah that prepared people for the coming of Jesus. But there's an Elijah spirit that will prepare people for the coming, the second coming of our Christ Jesus. So who was Elijah? Elijah means God is Jehovah. Friends, Elijah rose up in a time when they were worshipping Baal. And Baal means Lord, husband, master. And they believed Baal was God. And God raised up a man whose name was, my God is Jehovah. And he was a Tishbat. And Tishbat means captivity. He came out of captivity. I'm just going to tilt this a little. I'm not sure if it's good enough. Okay. He came out of captivity. He was a Tishbat, came out of activity. We don't know much about Elijah before he was born. But you can read the account in 1 Kings 17 verse 1. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize the stories for you today. Because there's so much to speak about, but I don't know how much time I've got. The lights are going out. Okay, so he was sent to address King Ahab. Now, I want you to understand what is happening here. King Ahab was married to, Je to Jezebel, and she was the daughter of Ethbal. Jezebel means, Baal is my husband. Ethbal means, I am with Baal. And Ahab, it says in 1 Kings 21 verse 25, sold himself to do evil. He did, um, he, he did more to provoke God to anger than any other king before him. And that was 1 Kings 16 verse 30. <coughs> so here we see a king. We see a king who sold himself to evil. A king is somebody that God has positioned to rule the country. It is a political spirit. It's somebody that God has positioned to rule the country and to lead the people into godliness. It's somebody that God has positioned because the Bible tells us that God puts leaders into position. So that they can bring people into the fullness of who they are meant to be. So now we see kings. Elijah was called to speak to kings. And to warn them against the Jezebel. Who was Jezebel? This was a spiritual a, a union, a marriage. Jezebel means my husband is Baal. So friends, Jezebel, the woman that Ahab, the king of Israel, married, worshipped Baal. 
God, Lord, husband, master, that made people a master to him. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. His idol was a bull, a bull that had arms and a face. To worship this idol, they used to take their firstborn child and sacrifice that to the idol for property. They also did sex orgies so that they could have provision from God, master, husband. So they had these sexual orgies and they had these perverted times of worship. They killed their children and they did blood sacrifice. For finance, he was the God of provision. He was the God of fertility. He was married to Asherah or Ishta, the worship of Easter, the God of, of fertility. He, he was the God of the rain and the God of the dew. They worshipped him because he would make sure that they had the abundant outpourings so that they could have provision. Everything about Baal was the pursuit of material prosperity, personal gain, success above all else. And we've got to understand the power of Baal worship. Now, friends, I want you to see a little bit of a parallel here because the Jesus said, the Bible tells us that before the coming of the Messiah, there would be an Elijah that would rise up to prepare the people to show them the way so that the Messiah could come. Now, we know that John the Baptist was that picture before Jesus came. And what was John? He was a man, a prophet. It says in Acts 2.17, in the last days, <coughs> sorry, I'm talking too fast. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The word prophesy means to teach and to declare and to speak the oracles of God. Even upon my hand servants, my prophets and my handmaidens. In the Old Testament, when Joel, when Joel prophesied this, he said, even upon my servants and all prophets in the Old Testament were called the servants of God and the female servants. I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. They'll dream dreams, they'll have visions and all the rest of it. And then it says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we see that with this outpouring of the prophetic anointing for the prophetic people, everybody can be prophetic. It's a prophetic end time church. And for the prophets, I'm going to pour out another mantle. I'm going to pour out my spirit and they will teach and they will preach and they will prophesy. And they will speak the oracles of God. And the result is that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There will be a great revival of salvation that will come from this outpouring. But he said a specific type of outpouring, friends. It's the outpouring of the spirit of Elijah. Now, we need to understand this. Now, when we look at Baal worship, which Jezebel was doing, she was worshiping Baal. It was a bull god made out of some form of metal or clay. It was in the pursuit of material prosperity and finances, and they gave everything to worship this bull. They gave their, their money. They made, they made blood sacrifice. It cost them their blood, sweat, and tears. It cost them their children, and they got involved in sexual orgies and absolute perversion for the sake of prosperity, personal gain. Now, we see the parallel between Elijah and what happened with Moses when he led people out of Egypt and friends the spirit of Elijah leads people out of the world system the money system the worship of Baal to the coming of the king that's what they do now why do I compare Baal with money system well in the desert the first thing that happened when Moses drew closer to God, when he said, I want to see your face, Lord, when he came into the glory, when he came into the highest form of worship, when he came into the greatest form of intimacy, and that's the key for all the end time prophets, understanding great forms of intimacy. And he came into the Shekinah, and we know what happened on the mountain. He saw the face of God. He was covered in glory. He came down. He was so anointed, full of the glory, that they had to cover his face. They couldn't look upon him. But while he was in the glory cloud, the people convinced Aaron. Aaron was a high priest. 
He was the anointed man of God. He was the holy man. He was the man that was meant to bring them closer to the mountain. Built them a calf, a golden calf in the image of the Egyptian idol called Ptah, P-T-A-H, which was the God of prosperity. And they called him God and they worshipped him. And what did it cost them? Their gold. And they had worshipped, my friends. And you know what? The worship was so raucous, the Bible says. What type of worship did they do at the calf? Six orgies. Three six. Absolute filling yourself with pleasure so that they could have prosperity. And they said, this is the God that led us out of Egypt. And they started worshipping the God of the money system. Well, friends, what does that have to do with us? Have you ever seen the raging bull in Wall Street? Have you ever seen the bronze calf that represents Wall Street? The finances, the core, the heart of worldly system of finances. What are people doing for the sake of prosperity, for the sake of, of their own wealth, friends? They are aborting their babies. It's costing their children. Not only that, they are sacrificing their children. We haven't got time to spend with our children because our blood, sweat and tears goes into making money for bigger properties, for bigger cars, for all kinds of personal gain. We send our children to boarding school for their best so we can make more money. No, it's not the best for your children to be trained up by the system of the ungodly friends. That is not the best for your children. The best for your children is to be trained up in the way that they should go. Then they will not depart therefrom. In the family, in the family church, in the place where God is glorified, not in the system of this world. But don't you understand it's the best schools, the best schools to do what? To educate them straight into hell. To educate them to worship Baal. To educate them to have their focus on success. One of the aspects of Baal worship is to have success above all things. Friends, are they sacrificing to Baal? Are you sacrificing to Baal? Instead of learning to trust God. In the desert, they built Ptah, the golden calf, the Egyptian creator God, the God of material wealth and prosperity, the God of fertility. Friends, our God is the creator, and he's the one that gives life and takes life. We don't go to a worldly source to receive that, which we've got to get straight from our almighty God. The difference is, friends, the one is all about self-effort, self-sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears. And the other one is all about faith, obedience, sacrifice, setting apart, hearing God. You choose. Now, there's even one more scary thing I want to share with you today. And that is at the Birmingham, Birmingham Commonwealth Games of 2022, last year, they opened the games, what with? A bull idol. It took 500 men to build them. It took five months to build. And it took 50 people to operate the bull idol. And they were worshipping the bull. This massive, big idol bull that they pulled into the stadium they were worshiping him they were laying down to him they were praising him they were pulling him and drawing him and dedicating themselves to him the same idol that they used to give their children to and burn them alive inside that bull friends do you understand what this is it's not a coincidence and behind him this beautiful temple of babel rose up in the lights Friends, it's all about coming back to serving the bull, the system of this world. And behind that is the God of the one world order, the God that was worshipped at Babel. We have to recognize and we have to see that is what God is warning us about and telling us about. So he raised up the spirit of Elijah. <coughs> Elijah had to go and address um, Ish, uh, Ahab, the king who'd been given the authority. And the king was married to Jezebel, and he had completely handed himself over to Jezebel. Now, what we have to understand, friends, what is Jezebel? 
It is not a person in the church that's controlling and maybe a little bit pushy and maybe a little bit um, battling with the fact that they saw all about themselves and striving. Name that what it is, a seductive controlling spirit of somebody in the church. That is not a Jezebel. They're not important enough. A Jezebel is a principality. It is a, it's a prince in the spirit realm, a demonic prince. And friends, a Jezebel will always position itself next to the kings. They will be the ones advising the kings. They'll be the ones seducing the kings. They'll be the one coming to take away the authority of a king. Jezebel positioned herself next to Ahab. She seduced him into Baal worship. It's all about money. You get rich. I'll make you rich. I'll make sure you've got everything. Worship of money, witchcraft, immorality. We're trying to fight a, a, a principality in our country. That is a Jezebel that has come against our leaders and seduced them into agreement. Friends, we've got to see what's going on here. And they rise up against the prophets. They will silence the prophets. What's going to try and silence the end time prophetic church? The spirit of Jezebel. What do we have to be aware of? Do not be silenced. Do not be silenced. You have a role to play. You've got to be positioned in this time. She was a principality that seduced the king until she took away his stamp of authority. She operated through witchcraft. It tells us that in 2 Kings 9 verse 22. Her master was Baal. Money, materialism. She craved power and destroyed anyone who tried to come against that. 1 Kings 1 verse 21 and 27. She hated the prophets because they identified her. 1 Kings 18 verse 4. And she stole people's property. She took that which belonged to others for her own sake. So friends, we have to understand exactly what we are dealing with. Now, this is a very, very powerful principality. But we've been called as the end time prophetic people to rise up against this principality. But it's important that we understand how we do it. Now, <clears throat> when we look at um, going back to the to the uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt, I want you to see what it was said about them. In Genesis 12, verse 1 to 8, God spoke to Abraham and told him to go from the from his land and people where he was living among the pagans in Ur in the Chaldees. He promised to show Abraham the land he was going to give him, and he was going to make Abraham into a great nation, and he would be a blessing to all the people. And God said to Abraham, I will give you the land of Canaan. Now, friends, the land of Canaan was occupied. It was occupied by seven other types of people. Those seven other types of people are the seven influences in the world. Finances, um, media, governments, and the medical services, it's the sciences, it's the influence of societies. That's what those seven, if you look at the names of those seven, which I have unfortunately forgotten to get them into order for you, but that's what they meant. And he said, I'm going to give you a land. You have to go and subdue that land and turn it into holy ground for my people. Friends, God has given us the earth. He said that earth belongs to people. What's occupying the earth? The seven different spheres of influence under the control of Baal, Satan, the one that's all about prosperity. It's all about self gain. And they had to go and conquer that, friends. But every time that they went into a land to conquer it, what would happen is that they would end up worshipping both. They would do Baal worship and God worship. And they would get their resources from Baal and then believe in God for the, the things that were like just faith and religion. Now it goes on in Genesis 15 and it says this. Your, excuse me, your descendants will be strangers in the country. It was not of their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years in the country that God said to Abraham, I'm giving you a country. But you are going to, your, your descendants are going to be enslaved there for 40 years. They will be mistreated. They will be punished. Um, they will be enslaved. And he says, 
after not 40, sorry, 400, after 400 years, God will punish that nation and lead the people out of it into great possessions. And that will be the fourth generation of Abraham's descendants that would return back to Canaan. So we see what happened is the people were led into a place, Egypt. They were provided for for a season. Then they became encaptured and enslaved. But God said it will only be for a season. And he said this. And God said to them as a nation, they had to wait that long before the sin of the Amorites had reached its full measure. Now, and then God would lead them out back into their promised land. There was some conquering they had to do. There was some establishing they had to do. Now, friends, why has Jesus taken so long to return? Because the sin, the iniquity of the Amorites has to reach its full potential. God has to allow the fullness of the rot of this world to reach its full potential so that he can destroy it. And then out of that, he's pulling a people that he has separated unto himself that he's going to take into the promised land. But in the journey, and God has separated people, and that's what it's all about. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be a separated one and a sent out one. And that's exactly what God has done. And in the time that they were enslaved, he gave them everything that they needed to live according to his kingdom. And he pulled them out. And in that time of the pulling out, and in the time of saying, I'm now getting ready to destroy that. He pulled them out and he said, why did he pull them into the desert, friends? He said, I'm taking, get, let my people go so that they can worship me. Six times he said, so that they can worship me. Why has God separated us in this time to learn to worship him? Now we have to understand that. But instead of worshiping God, what did they do? They worshiped Baal. And they ended up, instead of having a little while in the desert to prepare themselves, to cleanse themselves, to make sure that they were ready to enter into their promised land, friends, they ended up being there for 40 years because they would not surrender, they would not give up, and they would not receive the fullness of what God had for them. Now, I hope you're following what I'm saying to you. In Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6, it says this, See, I will send you the prophet of Elijah before the great and dreadful day when the Lord comes. So friends, they prophet the spirit of Elijah to come before the Messiah. But there's a prophet, uh, there's a promise in Malachi that says it's a specific day. It's before the great and the dreadful day that the Lord comes. Joel prophesied that before the great and the dreadful day, the Lord comes that there would be the outpouring of the Spirit. In Peter, it said the great and glorious day before the Lord comes, because he saw the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, what was Elijah's role? He had to confront the sin and the wickedness of that time. He had to come against Baal worship, friends. He had to challenge false religion. He had to prophesy. He had to speak into the atmosphere. Friends, you are dealing with a political, religious spirit. What did Jesus warn his disciples about? He said, beware of the seed of Herod and the seed of the Pharisees. It's a heast. Beware of the heast. It's going to come among the people and it's going to destroy them. The religious, political spirit. Why is it a religious political spirit? Because Jezebel led into false religion and Ahab was a, a, the political spirit. So here you see the political spirit being seduced by a religious spirit. And friends, the trouble is that's come into our churches. And that's why our gospel, it's all about me. It's all about how will you be blessed? How will you get rich? It's all about your success. Instead of being all about him. And a gospel that says, get out of her, my people, get out of her, get out of her. We have to understand, friends, what the hour is, what the season is, what the time is, and what the prophetic people look like. He confronted the sin of Baal. He predicted weather changes. Remember, Baal was the god of the rain. 
and he predicted the rain's going to stop. You, you trusting this source is going to stop. I'm saying to you today, people, the source of this world is going to run out on us. We've got to be ready for that. But he was able to pray in the reign of God, which is the outpouring of God's provision. He performed miracles. He operated in the supernatural of God. He raised the dead. He destroyed demonic altars. There was a threat and an intimidation to Jezebel. She was threat Jezebel was threatened by her, him. She was the illegal authority, but she tried to silence him. And then, friends, the most glorious thing is he prepared the Elisha and he was, he was lifted up to heaven. He never, ever went through anything of the tribulation of God. Now, I want to just look at those things very quickly. Number one, how did he confront the system? He came against the altars. And this is really important for us to understand, friends. He came against the altars. He did not come against Jezebel. He did not touch Jezebel. He came against the altars. What does it mean? It means he was a standard. He said, this is the way to live. That's not the way to live. And then when they built up their altars and they were giving their sacrifices and they were worshiping and they were living like hell thinking they're going to heaven. And friends, what did they do? They perverted worship into sex. They perverted that they were to, to wait upon the Lord and to hear what God had for them and to walk in what God had for them. It was all about striving and self-effort. They gave their children, they gave their blood, and they gave their sexual behavior. They absolutely walked, walked the morality of the time. And friends, we're living in a society like that. But he raised up a standard and he said, that's not God. That's not God. This is what God is. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of purity. He was a prophet of God. He said, God is my Jehovah. My Jehovah is God. He walked in the things of God. We see the raising up of John the Baptist. Bold, very courageous. He had a standard. He stood for righteousness and truth. He said, this is the way to go. He separated himself from the ways of this world. Elijah was fed by ravens supernaturally and was given water at the brook when the rest of the world had nothing. John the Baptist was fed in the desert. It said by locusts and honey. And friends, we know that there's a type of plant that's called a locust plant. But the point is he was fed. Elijah was fed. I want to tell you the prophet that God is calling up in this time. You don't have to worry about the reign of this world and the system of this world. The supernatural king of Jesus Christ will feed you. He will look after you. He will provide for you. But there's a condition. You've got to raise up in the standard. He said, this is wrong. He did not mind the fact that there were 400 of them challenging him. He said, this is wrong. When they were building the altars, to worship Baal, to do what Baal says, to please Baal. Friends, we cannot please Baal. We cannot please Baal. We cannot have a system that says you cannot buy or sell unless you have a mark, unless you have a mark, unless you have what it takes to qualify you. We cannot bow to Baal. We cannot bow to Baal when it says if you do not do this, you will not be able to survive. Friends, Baal is a forceful self sacrificing God that produces self-success. Whatever they're saying, whatever they're telling you, do not bow to it. We cannot bow to Baal. We cannot bow to the ox, to the bull sitting outside Wall Street. We cannot bow to the bull of Birmingham. We cannot bow to the bull that's rising up that says, unless you follow this health system, unless you do what we tell you, unless you do this money control system, you will not succeed. We cannot bow to the ball that steals your property. That's the next thing they're going to come and say, we've got the right to take your children. We cannot bow to them. We cannot bow to the fact that our children have to be sacrificed to a world system. We cannot bow by saying, I will be silent to the crappiest things, the horriblest things that they're teaching my children in schools and say, what can I do? I will not bow to ball. And friends, 400 of Baal's worshippers built fires and built, and they were dramatic and they worshipped him and they called out witchcraft and, and they're calling on witchcraft to seduce your children through the television, 
to seduce your children with the music, to seduce your children with the education system, and to seduce you with media and with the system of this world science. They are calling on witchcraft. Sorcery and pharmacia, pharmacist, is the same word. It is witchcraft. And they are calling you down. And how did Elijah destroy them? Friends, he built an altar. You have to build an altar, friend. It's an altar of worship. It's an altar of coming. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. Oh, Holy Spirit. It's an altar of worship. It's an altar of going into the place that Moses had to go into. That high worship. That glorious worship of having your face covered in glory. And friends, when he went into worship. You see, friends, he did not pray for hours to pull down the Baal altars. He did not go and pull them down with his own hands, friends. We don't go and stand outside and pull things down and burn things. He worshipped, friends, and he worshipped until the fire came down. He worshipped until the glory came down. And he drew from the water. He saturated his altar with water until the water was pouring. Friends, we've got to have altars where we are so saturated in the water of the Holy Spirit that it's pouring off us. And we've got to release the fire of heaven to pull down the Baal altars, friends. We have to understand what it means to be a prophet in this season and in this time, friends. We cannot flirt with Baal. We cannot. And friends, I want to say this to you. As a body of Christ, we've been flirting with Baal for so long. We've allowed the rich and famous to be the ones supporting our ministries. They control you. They have you. They hold you. We allow that which is the voice of Jezebel to speak into our ears of what it should look like, of striving and trying to do things in our own strength, friends. When it is the almighty God, the King, Jehovah, that is calling us to serve him. And friends, everything about Elijah and John the Baptist is they were humble men. They were not proud. They were not arrogant. They were not people that in their own right was wanting attention. In fact, friends, it was the exact opposite. People didn't want to give them attention because they weren't comfortable with them. And God is calling up in a larger generation that will raise a standard. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God is going to raise a standard against it. Friends, what is that standard? It's your life and my life that will not bow to the altars of Baal. Then it goes on in Isaiah 60 and it says, now arise. And shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. See, the darkness covers the earth, the deep darkness the people, but the glory has risen on you. Friends, the glory rose on Elijah when he worshipped, and the power of the Holy Spirit was poured all over the altar, and the fire of God came down, and it burnt up all the others, friends. The glory of God came onto Moses, friends. And he walked down into that place where they were worshipping God. Baal. And he destroyed it. And he took that gold from that bar and he made it fine and he threw it into their drinking waters. And water always represents the Holy Spirit. And he said, now you drink that perverted, polluted stuff so that you can be purged by the Holy Spirit. Friends, it takes an Elijah people that have been in the glory that walk out of that glory, that think different, that speak different, that stand different, that are not intimidated, they're not proud, they're not trying to promote themselves, they're not looking for the accolades of man. They want to hear the voice of God say, that is my friend, that is my son, that is my daughter, don't you dare touch them. And then, friend, we see how when Jezebel herself, the, princip the, 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 the religious spirit, rose up to kill Elijah. Friends, he did not go and fight her. And I want to say this. I've got to finish this message before the end of my time. He did not fight Jezebel. He fled from Jezebel. Why? Because he knew he wasn't there to fight the system. He wasn't there to fight the principality, friends. He fled from her. Friends, when John the Baptist rose up to speak to Herod, 
And he challenged Herod about the Jezebel called Herodias in his courts. The same thing. Political spirit, religious spirit. She was seducing him into a false religion. Into a seduction. She was not even his wife. She was his brother's wife. But that wasn't good enough. She needed to be the king's lover. And friends, there are many people that are needing to be the lover of a king so that they can have the power that they need. And friends, when he went and he said, this is wrong, you mustn't do it. Herod went and told Herodias. At that point, John the Baptist should have fled. He should have left because his battle was not with Jezebel. He was told to speak truth and righteousness to the king. And friends, political spirits have to, I mean, I'm so sorry, the spirit of Elijah in this time has to speak truth to the king. They've got to speak truth and righteousness and the standard of godliness to the king. But when they see the Jezebel rise up against them and she will always kill those who recognize her, she will destroy them, she will pull them down, she will kill them. When they, she starts doing that, they've got to get out of the way, friends. And why do I say that? Because Elijah was not called to destroy Jezebel. He was called to pull the people out of her, out from under her, to lead them into glory. Now, how was he meant to pull them out? Number one, he led Elisha into Gilgal. Friends, what is Gilgal? It's the place of reproach and the place of circumcision. It's the place of repenting. And being baptized, it's the place of getting out of there. It's the place of preparing the people. Malachi said before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, terrible things will come upon the earth. But he said the spirit of Elijah, the prophet of Elijah will rise up and turn the hearts of the fathers back to their sons and the sons back to their fathers. The fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. Jezebel will cause the sons to reject their fathers. Jezebel will call the fathers to lay down and die like Ahab and not be the good authoritarians and not the denominators, the ones that walk in their authority, not dominating, not controlling, that protect people, that build a platform for people and that promote people into their full destiny. That's a father, friends. Somebody that can come alongside you, that will make a platform for you to be safe in the things of God. That will build a protection over you that the enemy can't get to you and promote you into your full destiny. They will guide you. They will direct you. You see, friends, we're living in a world where the fathers have laid down and died like Ahab. And we're living in a world where the sons say, we don't want fathers. Where the young people say, don't talk to us, we'll do our own thing. The king that led his country with the advice of the, 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 the advisors that were his age was destroyed, friends. Because he rejected the voice of the fathers. And I'm saying to you now, every single person walking in the anointing of the prophet of Elijah will turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers and the fathers back to their children. They will help fathers to rise up in their position, in their authority, in their government, not in domination, not in control. That is a Jezebelic type of father. And they will call the children, men and women, it says in Acts 2 to rise up and to take their rightful place. The zeal and the wisdom walking together. Friends, it is time for us as young people to find older people, wise, rooted in Christ, full of Holy Spirit, that have got a journey. Look over their shoulder. Where have they been? Which giants have they conquered? Are they the mighty men that David rose up that have killed their Goliaths? Those are the ones you go and draw life from. Not those that are feeding the ball idols. Not those that will tell you how to puff yourself up and become famous and rich and glorious and dress in a certain way and speak in a certain way and get all the attention that will make your pockets rich. Do not listen to those advisors. They are worshipping like Aaron Baal. Listen to the advisors that tell you how to love God, how to worship, how to live a life where your family is important, where who you are as a man of integrity is important and a woman of integrity where you prepare to lay down yourself for the sake of your family and not hand your family off to anybody to institutionalize them for the sake of your finances. Listen to the right advisors, friends. Young people, get your hearts back into the hands of people that you can be safe with. 
It says, if you're sick, call the elders, old wise people, and people that are ordained to be leaders in the church. Friends, you cannot be an elder in a church. If you're 19 years old, you've never run a family. You've never done any of those things. You do not know how to do it. You're living on theory. That is not your elder. No matter what man puts into position, the Bible has a very different picture. And so we've got to understand what it looks like, friends. I'm talking strongly to you, and many people will put this off and not ever listen to it again. I'm coming in the spirit of Elijah. I'm calling the fathers to rise up and to take their rightful place and to look after the young people coming through that have to walk in the glory of God. And I'm calling the young people to stop living proud lives and stop living puffed up lives and to start listening to those that can help direct you out of wisdom. They burnt up their own zeal and made many mistakes. You need their wisdom. They need your zeal. Together, you can destroy the works of the evil one. We need to understand that, friends. So he led Elisha. Number one, he called Elisha out from where Elisha was living in the system of this world, his own effort. He called him out and he said, follow me. Friends, we've got to call some people out of a world system and say, follow me, which means discipling, which means showing them how to do it, friends. He took him to Gilgal, the place of reproach, the place of circumcision, the place where the whole of the Israelite army out of leaving Egypt had to be circumcised before they could possess their land. And then, friends, he led them to a house of, to Bethel. And Bethel means the house of God. And friends, out of the house of God, he did not lead him to himself. He led him to the house of God. He led him to the presence of God. Why was it called Bethel? Because that's where Jacob had his encounter of the open heaven. And he saw the angels coming, going up and coming down. And he saw the Lord standing high upon the top. And the Lord called him to come into his presence. And friends, they lead people into the presence of God to be able to live in two realms, to be able to worship, to be able to encounter the and see what the angels are doing on this earth, to be able to encounter living in the kingdom as well as on this earth, to live in two realms, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places and to walk on this earth. We are in the world. We're not of the world, but we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are a new creation. We are set apart. Come out of her, my people. Come and repent and be baptized. And then, friends, he led her to Jericho, the place of fragrance, the place of the walls coming down. Friends, when Elijah was worshiping, when he was pouring the water all over his altar, and when he worshiped until the fire came down, he demonstrated the Israelites going to Jericho, walking. Friends, it takes walking. It takes standing. It takes knowing your authority. It takes being quiet and just listening to God. If we had more prayer meetings where people were quiet, listened to God, and then only did what God told them to do, we would see more walls coming down. And when the time was right, God said, stand. And they stood. And he said, now, at the blow of the trumpet, shout. Friends, that is praise. That is praise. It is the blow of the trumpet, the blow of the horn, the sound of the drums. It is the warfare of the instruments and shouting. And the walls came down. Friends, after we've learned how to go into glory, we learn how to pull down some walls. And Elisha had to learn that to be able to come into his destiny. Elijah's today have to learn how to lead people into the position of being circumcised. John the Baptist said, repent and be baptized, repent and be baptized, repent and be baptized. And he drew people to him that he was discipling. We know that some of his disciples eventually left him and joined Jesus to be discipled by him. Well, that's the point. The point is you bring them to the place where they can carry on with Jesus in their own right. And then, friends, he led them to the Jordan. And he showed him how to cross over. You see, that Jordan was a boundary line. The enemy couldn't cross that. But he crossed it. He opened it and he crossed it. He hit it with his cloak. And Elijah went through. And Elisha followed him. And friends, there's a going through to another place, another realm, another way of living that we have to discover on our journey. And it only happens through our Gilgal, through our Bethel, through our Jericho. 
and then our Jordan. And friends, in the Jordan, Elisha said, I want your mantle. Friends, no man can give you a mantle. Stop it. Stop running after people to give you a mantle. The Father himself has to give you that mantle. So many people have gone to receive a mantle from a person. You will get something, but you won't get that which the Father has got for you. You'll get what that person will give you. And it's not always lovely, friends. It's not always lovely because you don't know what you're asking for. And in that moment, Elijah said to Elisha, I can't give this to you. He said, but if you see me leaving, you can have it. And friends, that's exactly what happened. You see, Elisha was taken up into the realms of heaven. And that's the next thing I want you to know about Elisha. Friends, Elijah did not have to die. And there's a generation of people coming that will not have to die. There's a generation of people that will leave this earth and Jezebel will still be operating. That will leave this earth and Jezebel will still be having a wild time in her, in her, in her activities. But they would have led a whole lot of people to cross the Jordan. And friends, there's a season of crossing a Jordan. There's a season where we will be pulled out. There's a season of coming and receiving a double mantle. And Elisha walked in the double mantle of Elijah, and he could do everything double. Now, Jesus said, before I come, there'll be a people that will do much more than I ever did. Much more than I did. John the Baptist went to go and address Herod the way that he was meant to, but he stayed and he was destroyed, decapitated by Herodias. And friends, I want to say this to you. If you come up against Jezebel, you will be destroyed. Your authority will be removed and you will not be able to carry on. But if you focus on what you are meant to do, what are you meant to do? Understand worship. Understand the power of destroying the Babel, the, the Baal altars that people are following. Pull people out of darkness, out of a system, out of the ways of this world. Pull them out. How do you do that? By showing them, by leading them. Elijah said, follow me, follow me. Follow me. Do what I'm doing. And he led him through, friends, to the place that he could receive a double mantle from God, from Jesus, not from man. And then he left. And there's a people that God is preparing to leave. But, friends, we have to understand we're not going to go when life becomes uncomfortable. We're going to go when we have surrendered so much there's nothing left to give. That's when we're going to go, friends. Because there's a Jordan to cross. And there's something that we've got to be able to live a different way of living. To be able to enter into that place where we can just go straight into heaven. We've got to live a glorified life, friends. But we can take as many people with us as we possibly can. So what will happen to Jezebel? Well, the first thing is, it says in Revelations 2, verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess by her teachings, the misleading of her, um, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and into the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent for her immorality, but she is unwilling. So the first thing God is saying is do not tolerate Jezebel. Prophetic end time, Elijah spirited people, do not tolerate Jezebel. That means her influence upon our lifestyles. Do not worship Baal. Do not build the altar of Baal. Do not give your children to Baal. Do not give your blood, sweat, and tears to Baal. Do not be so busy making money that you cannot be in the temple of God. And then in Revelation 17, it says this. Come, I will show you the punishment for the great prostitute who sits on the many waters with the kings of this earth, committing adultery. Jezebel sits with kings committing adultery against God. And the inhabitants of the earth are intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert, and there I saw the woman sitting on the scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. The beast that was covered with blasphemous names? Birmingham, at that um, event that they had in, in 2022, the woman was lifted up and dressed in white. She calmed the beast. She sat on it and the beast was covered 
with words of blasphemy, friends. Have a look. Go watch it. Go look for yourself. Friends, the emblem in Wall Street is a little girl dressed, standing, innocent girl standing, controlling the raging bull. There's a Jezebel controlling this bull, friends. And she's going to ride this bull, and we're going to see it. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. Sounds a bit like some religious leaders, doesn't it? She held a golden cup in her hand, full with the abomination, abominable things and the filth of her adulterers. This was written on her forehead, mystery, uh, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of the prostitutes and the abomination of the earth. I saw that the woman had drunk from the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. He goes on to say in 18 verse 4, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up in heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she was given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. Let her heart, um, in her heart she boasted, I sit as queen, I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire for the mighty for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So friends, Elijah, spirit of the end time, and my time's about to run out, are not to rise up against Jezebel. Do not rise up against the religious political spirit. Do not come in agreement with it. Do not tolerate it. Do not bow down to it. Do not submit to it. Just get out of its way. Just remove yourself from it. Be separated unto God. Find ways that you will not be in the position of worshipping this spirit. When it directly comes against you, flee. Paul at Ephesus, God said to him, Paul, flee. Jesus, when they came to kill Jesus, he fled. But Paul walked straight into captivity when he went to Rome because God said, now I want you to walk into it. Jesus went straight to the cross when they came to fetch him. Do you know that twice Herod tried to find Jesus and twice Jesus avoided Herod. And the third time God said, now. And he gave himself over and he said, here I am. And he laid himself down. Friends, our job is not to come against the Jezebel spirit. Our job is not to come against the system. But our job is to avoid the effects of the system and get people out of the effects of the system and be separated from the effects of the system. And our greatest weapon of warfare is our worship, friends. It's our own circumcision. It's our own being absolutely set free from the God of this world, being transformed by the renewing of our mind that we don't draw from the system of this world. And friends, when people talk about circumstances, money, cost, and I had to do it, we had to move because of money, I'm telling you now they're feeding Baal. Because if we don't do anything for the sake of Baal, we do it for the sake of the Almighty God. My God is Jehovah. Not Baal, not Lord, not Master, not Control, not the God of Provision, not the God of Fertility. His wife, Ashra. I will not bow to the Ashra pole. I will not bow to that which is paganism. I will not bow to the system of this world. God is raising up the spirit of Elijah, who will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the children back to their fathers. And if that doesn't happen, he says, terrible, terrible things are going to happen on the land. He says, we have to turn back. Now, friends, fathers are physical, they're spiritual, and they're mentors. Mentors that lead us into the order, the government, and the, and the things of God. Sons are those that are born from that mentoring, physical, spiritually discipled. Every one of us are called to disciple. Every one of us are called to go into the, all the world. Every one of us are called to go find the Elishas. And every one of us are called to disciple them through Jericho, through Bethel, sorry, through Gilgal, through Jericho, through Bethel and lead them into the Jordan.
where they can receive their own mantle while we prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, friends. I've rushed through this, but I've needed to give you information quickly. And my time is just about to go out because my lights are going out. Love you all so much. My heart's cry is, wake up, church. Wake up, sons of God. Wake up. Sons of Ishaka, read the signs of the times. We've been fooled once. Do not be fooled again. Do not come into agreement with political, religious spirits. Operate in the spirit of Elijah. You will be fed supernaturally. You will receive drink supernaturally. You will heal the sick supernaturally. You will cause abundance of overflow supernaturally, like Elijah told the widow on how to raise up her provision. You will help people to get blueprints from heaven of how to be able to provide for their families. It does not include the system of this world supernaturally. And you will be able to do the supernatural. You do not have to rely on the system of this world. Elijah was teleported. He was taken from one place to another by God. There will be, we will be teleported, not because of self-effort, but because of the Holy Spirit. We will operate in the place Elisha did, where he was able to open our eyes to see, and he was able to shut eyes not to see. And friends, I want to tell you, we will open the eyes of those that need to see kingdom of God, and we will shut the eyes of those that are a threat to what God's called us to do. So rise up, spirit of Elijah. Rise up, worshippers. Rise up, bold and very courageous. Since the days of John the Baptist, a bold and courageous people have pushed back darkness. And until we meet again, goodbye.